Now we get to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is oscillations. Uh, what, the way that you saw this in your introductory class was a mass on a spring, um, where you were usually considering something like a simple mass hanging from a spring, um, and you considered the spring massless, and um, you just looked at oscillations relative to that. Um, when I covered this in my introductory class, I remember thinking, oh dear God, this is very specific. When are we ever going to run into something that is just a mass on a spring? I didn't even recall seeing, you know, it seemed very contrived, something contorted just to make it work for an introductory physics class. What I missed at the time was how universal it is that you can approximate so many systems as a, a mass on a spring. So let's start with, um, we'll assume a one-dimensional mass on a spring. So you're, you know, something like this, the, uh, the spring and the mass can only move in one dimension. And we have the, the force in the x direction here. I'm going to define x to be here along the, the vertical. The force in the x direction is negative k x minus x naught, so that it is always, it is a restoring force wherever the equilibrium position x naught is, it tries to bring the mass back to the equilibrium position. So if the mass is below its equilibrium position, then the force acts up. If the mass is above its equilibrium position, the force acts down. No matter what, the force is always acting to restore the spring to its equilibrium position. This then has the form for the potential energy of one half times the spring constant x squared. So the reason why this is much more universal is because life is a Taylor series. Uh, everything can be expanded as a Taylor series. So whatever potential I have, um, I can always write it as some constant plus another constant times x plus one half times another constant x squared and so on. And I even can expand my Taylor series not about x equals zero, but I can choose to expand my Taylor series about any given point. So then um, I can continue on like this. And if I talk about specific uh, points in the potential, so here let's take our potential as a function of x, and I can have dips and valleys, and let's look at an arbitrary point here where I have a stable equilibrium point. And what I'm going to do here, I'm going to expand about that point. I'm going to be, you know, remember a good physicist is a lazy physicist. So I am going to redefine my coordinate systems, my coordinate system, so that this is now my, um, this is now where I put the zero at that x equals zero. And I am going to look at the potential relative to that. So because my choice of the zero of potential is arbitrary, I can choose any old thing. And then I'm going to take this Taylor series that I wrote down here. Um, if I am at a, a maximum or a minimum in the potential, then what I have here is that this first derivative, because remember, this is, let me actually write this as the potential at x0. Um, that's the value of the constant. This constant is the derivative evaluated at x0. This constant is the second derivative evaluated at x0. Um, so, if I am at a maximum or a minimum, 
then this term right here goes to zero. And in that case, I have a potential which is of the form u of x naught. Let me actually switch back to my favorite marker. See, when you reach your, my point in life, you have a favorite marker. All right, so this is the potential at x equals 0 plus 1 half the second derivative at x equals 0 times x minus x naught. And then I can arbitrarily set this. I can redefine my coordinate system. So I'm going to shift my coordinates. So I have x prime of x, where I've now chosen x, not, uh, x of x naught, the, uh, the zero position to be zero. And I've chosen x naught, I put x naught at the origin. So then I have that the potential is, oh, this is a poor notation. Let me not call it x, u prime. Let me call it v so that I don't um, so that I don't have a prime mean a derivative in one case and a different variable in another. So this is V. The potential is one half times the second derivative evaluated now at my zero times x squared. Now this potential is exactly the same form as this potential here to have a stable equilibrium this term has to be positive. So anytime that I have a stable equilibrium, I can approximate my system as a mass on a spring. Isn't that beautiful? Any type of bound system, because you can always take a Taylor series, you can always estimate a bound system as a mass on a spring. Now, how good that approximation works depends on how far this, uh, this little dip can be approximated as, uh, um, as a parabola. Um, but you can do it all the time. So then we can go back to one of the more complicated problems that we did in the last chapter. For this problem right here with the box balancing on a, a circle with a fixed axis, we had gotten the potential energy is, uh, the potential energy as a function of the angle theta is mg times r plus b times cosine of theta plus r theta sine theta. And in this case, this is a, so this is a big, ugly, hairy equation, but we can see if we can approximate it at, well, as, um, as a Taylor series. So we're going to start by, or approximate it as a mass on a spring by looking at the Taylor series. We're going to start by noting that the first couple non-zero, we're trying to get something that looks like a quadratic term in theta. So knowing what we're trying to look for, we're going to go out to terms of order theta squared. So cosine is approximately equal to 1 minus 1 half theta squared, and sine is approximately equal to theta. Um, so we can use these approximations. We also know that in this case our equilibrium position happens to be theta equals zero, which means that we don't have to worry about setting the equilibrium position to something other than zero. All right, so then we can write this as mg r plus b minus 1 half r theta squared minus 1 half b theta squared plus r theta
theta squared. Now here, I'm going to just note everything in these brackets has a dimension of distance so that because theta is unitless so i can do my unit check i still have sensible units now here i have a constant r plus b and uh um and then here i can write this as so I have r theta squared minus 1 half r theta squared, which gives me 1 half r theta squared. And then I have 1 half negative b theta squared. So I can write, I can combine these three terms and write them as some constant times theta squared. And then here I can see that, actually here I should be careful and write, this is not exactly equal to, this is approximately equal to this. Um, so here I can see that I have a constant plus a term which is quad quadratic in theta, um, and I can read this off, read off my k. Here I have my constant and then times one half m g r minus b theta squared. Um, so my k, my, the equivalent of my spring constant is here and I can see that my system, well first of all this is going to be stable if r is greater than b. If r is less than b, then I have a negative number here and my equilibrium point is unstable because I have a, when I plot u as a function of theta, um, and here I'm actually looking at zero. So if r is greater than b, then right here I have that type of structure. And if r is less than b, then I have something that looks like that. I have a local minimum. Um, so then I can see that if r is greater than b, this box is just going to oscillate back and forth on, uh, on, that, uh, on that cylinder. So then what we can do is, I'm going to zoom in and here, we are going to draw the potential energy and we are going to plot it versus the equilibrium point. So in this case, this was our theta and um, we have some offset and it looks like this. Um, so you might have some total energy, uh, the total energy is equal to the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. And when we talk about our box sitting on top of the square here, the, um, <clears throat> the potential energy is going to be slightly, um, if it is exactly at the center, the potential energy is zero. Um, but it might be moving when it's at that at the center. Um, and so you have, you can talk about the total amount of energy in the system. And let me draw, label my axes. This is the potential energy. And you can draw the total energy here. Um, and the total energy if you have some kinetic energy, uh, you, the difference between here and here is the kinetic energy at the top. So here it's wobbling back and forth. And then when it reaches far enough, what it's going to do is, uh, is turn around. And that turning point is when all of the, um, when all of the energy is the potential energy. Sorry, is kinetic? Yeah, uh, when all of the energy is potential energy. So we could then draw 
what the, um, let me try to get color, we can draw what the, um, the kinetic energy looks like. It is just the total energy minus the, um, minus the potential energy. So here, then, let's see, this point is about halfway, and this is going to do something kind of like that. Um, so, um, as the box oscillates, the amount of the distribution of the energy is oscillating as well. So then, because we can uh, describe so much of our so many physics problems as like a mass on a spring oscillating, we're going to revisit this problem and cover it in great detail. We're going to start because you guys now. You are reaching the big leagues. You're looking at upper division physics classes. So we can give you harder problems. We are going to approach this equation, m, the double dot of x, the second derivative of the mass times the second derivative of the position equals negative kx. Um, and we are going to solve this in general. Um, we can rewrite this as x double dot equals negative k over m times x, which is equal to negative omega squared x, where I have chosen suggestively to define omega as the square root of k over m. And then we can write the period, so the frequency of oscillation is, the angular frequency is 2 pi times the frequency, and the frequency is 1 over the period. So this is, one over, is 2 pi over the period, and your book uses the symbol tau for the period. So you can write tau equals 2 pi times the square root of m over k. All right, so that's our period. Um, we are going to look at solutions, and we are going to um, use the exponential solutions. We covered a little bit of this at the end of Chapter 2, um, so this is somewhat review, um, but I'm going to go over it again just because it is so important. Um, so we're going to use the exponential forms of the solution, at least to start where we say x of t is some constant which can be complex, e to the i omega t plus some other constant, e to the negative i omega t. Here I'm using the fact that I'm using um, Euler's equation, e to the i theta equals cosine theta plus i sine theta, so I can, write, uh, I can write sines and cosines as exponentials. The reason I might want to do that is that it's very easy to take, ex uh, to take derivatives of exponentials. It's much harder to take derivatives of um, sinusoidal functions. So um, when I do this, I, well, I can use the exponential solutions. I can use Sinusoidal solutions, x of t equals a cosine omega t plus b sine omega t. I can use a phase shifted cosine. x of t is a cosine omega t minus some phase shift. Or I can use x of t is the real part of some complex solution. So basically saying the real part, or I could equally well say the imaginary part of this. Um, 
So these are all equivalent solutions. Um, we will just refresh our memory real quickly. So the reason why we use this form is because our solution says that we have, our differential equation says that we have, we are looking for a function whose second derivative is proportional to the function itself. The second derivative of a cosine goes like a cosine. The second derivative of a sine goes like a sine. Um, the second derivative of an exponential goes like an exponential. Um, so if we take option C, x of x dot of t is a omega, negative a omega sine omega t minus delta, x double dot of t equals negative a omega squared cosine omega t minus delta. And then here I'm going to write that this is negative omega squared times x. Then I'm going to plug this in here. I get, I'm so far not going to assume that I, right now I'm not going to assume that I know omega, and I'm going to show you that I get this expression for omega. So m times negative omega squared x equals negative kx. Now I have negatives on both sides. Let me use a different color. So I meant to have contrast negatives on both sides, and I have x on both sides, so I can cancel that out. And I get m omega squared equals k, or omega squared equals k over m, which is omega equals the square root of k over m. So if I do not assume, if I, if I assume I have this type of solution and see if it works, I can plug it in and I see that in fact it works as long as I have omega equals the square root of k over m. Um, there is a lot of ugly algebra to show that each of these is also a solution and that they are equivalent. To show that they are equivalent, you would have to show that you can find con a relationship between constants C1 and C2, and for instance, A and B right here, that you can get a relationship between the constants A and B and uh, this phase angle delta. It's a bunch of dumb algebra. There is a problem in the book that has you do this, um, and I'm not going to do it in the lecture. All right, so here we have a bottle which is submerged in water. The, the book says it's submerged in a bucket, but it doesn't actually have to be a bucket. The, all that matters is that you have a, well, a bottle submerged in a liquid. It doesn't even have to be water. Um, and what we can do is now write down the net force. So we are going to confine the, um, the motion to one dimension, we're going to imagine it's just bouncing up and down. Now, actually, it can tilt side to side. Um, but for now, we're going to imagine it's just bouncing up and down. Um, and the net force is equal to the force due to gravity. So here, um, we are lining up the x-axis pointing down which the book does not specify, but uh, I'm going to switch to my favorite marker. We're lining the um, x-axis down. In that case, the force due to gravity is positive, and then there's the buoyant force, which moves it up, which is the, um, it is equivalent to the mass of water displaced. So that is, or the mass of liquid displaced. So that is rho, well, the weight of the water displaced. Rho times the area of the bottle. Um, so here I have some area. I'm going to assume that the bottle, that we don't 
get around the neck because that makes the problem somewhat more complicated. So the area of the bottle times the, um, times the depth of the bottle in the liquid, where this is the depth. So the mass of water displaced is the um, is equal to the volume or the mass of liquid displaced is equal to the volume of the liquid times the density of the liquid and then the buoyant force is that mass times the gravitational constant um, we can see that uh, the at the equilibrium point the force is equal to zero so that is when m g minus rho a d of the equilibrium point times g is equal to zero. Now here um, we have our, we have a g everywhere so I can cancel out a g and I'm going to call my equilibrium point rather than d e q, I'm going to follow the book's notation and call this d zero um, and I get that M equals rho A D zero or D zero equals M over rho A. I want to point out here, this is not the fundamental equation. The fundamental physical concept deriving the buoyant force is that the buoyant force has a magnitude of the equal to the weight of the mass, uh, uh, the weight of the liquid displaced. Okay, so that gives me the equilibrium position, and I can then um, I can then do a variable shift. So what I'm going to do is write this. Um, I'm going to assume so force is equal to mx double dot and that is equal to mg minus rho a d g and I want to write that in the form some constant times the displacement x, and I want to try to figure out what that displacement x is. So this is my variable which is changing, and I, so I'm going to have an equilibrium point, um, d naught, and so I actually want it really to be written as, I, I actually want this force to be of the form negative k x minus my equilibrium point. Well, so here I'm trying to group this so that I get it in that form. So if I pull out all of the constants, um, here I have negative m g I want to, or I actually want to pull out a negative rho a g because I want that to multiply um, my constant or my my d so negative rho a d minus m and then divided by rho a. And then I can see that this is negative rho a g d, or sorry, yeah, d minus d naught. Actually, 
want to define my x so that this is just x. So I'm going to include the variable shift there. Then I can read off of this that this is my k. So my k is equal to rho g a. Um, I can further write this as, I'm going to eliminate the row and the a. Ah, here I, see this is d minus d naught. Ah, yes, so this is not, so this is, yeah, my k is rho g a, and then um, I can write my omega squared has to equal k over the square root of, my omega squared is k over m, so that's rho g a over m, and that I can use this definition to write this as g over d naught. And then I can rewrite my equation as x double dot equals negative g over d naught x, where x is equal to d minus d naught. So my displacement from the equilibrium position, the second derivative of my displacement with, displacement with respect to the equilibrium position, d naught, is uh, negative g over d naught times x. And then we can look at a, um, we can look at this. So this then has the form, if you remember back from intro physics, the angular frequency squared of a pendulum was g over l. You probably saw this as omega equals the square root of g over l. So this has the same exact form as a simple pendulum. It's also, it's oscillating, and it's oscillating back and forth sinusoidally. We can then look at examples. So if you have, so here, this only depends on the equilibrium position, however deep the equilibrium position is, um, and g. So if you take d naught equals 20 centimeters, then you can plug in and see that the period is equal to 0.9 seconds. Now this depends uh, inversely on the, um, on the depth. So if you get, uh, if you have something which is submerged further, it's oscillation from the surface. The angular frequency is going to get smaller. So it's going to oscillate back and forth slower. So if you have a bottle, it's going to bob up and down rather quickly. If you have a cruise ship, it will bob up and down much more slowly because it is submerged to a greater depth. We can then look at what happens to the energy distribution. So uh, we have, for this type of solution, we have that x equals a cosine omega t plus, well, minus delta. Here, I'm just going to use the cosine form. Um, you could use any of the forms of solution. Um, and then we have t equals one half x dot, uh, one half m x dot squared, and u equals one half kx squared. 
So here I can write down my derivatives and we will plug in and see what happens to the total energy as well as the kinetic and the potential energy separated. So negative A omega sine omega T minus delta X double dot is negative A omega squared cosine omega T minus delta. So my kinetic energy, this is just a constant. Actually, I am going to um, write A. In, instead of putting an A out in front, I'm going to call the constant X naught because it corresponds to the largest value that X takes. So if we have it written explicitly is X naught, when we are doing our unit checks, we can make sure that the units work out. All right, so here I have one half m x, when I square x dot, I get x squared omega squared sine omega t minus delta squared. And then I further have omega squared equals k over m. So I can plug this in for omega squared and write this as one half k x naught squared sine squared omega t minus delta. And then here I plug this in, I get one half k x naught squared cosine squared omega t minus delta. My total energy is equal to the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. I tend to wear out the green marker. There's a, two green markers, and I tend to wear out the green marker, and that green marker needs a break. All right, kinetic plus potential energy. This is going to be this plus that. So I can pull out a 1 half k x naught squared, and I have sine squared omega t minus delta plus cosine squared omega t minus delta, which is just equal to 1 half k x naught squared. So my total energy is constant, um, and it is equal to 1 half k times the maximum of the displacement. I can also write this, so V not the V max, I will write as that has to be omega x max, and this is equal to, um, well, we'll just leave it as omega x max. So I can rewrite. Um, this is one half, I'm going to put the K in as, uh, actually I will leave the, yeah, I will have one half K, um, and then I'm going to put in for X naught, I have V max squared over omega squared. And this, I'm going to put in omega squared equals k over m. So I get that the total energy is 1 half m v max squared. So the total energy is equal to either the maximum potential energy or the maximum kinetic energy.
We can then look at what happens with our, now notice we've set our potential energy to be equal to zero um, at its minimum. So I can look at the total, I can look at the energy um, as a function of time and let's set theta, set delta equal to zero. So if delta is equal to zero, initially all of my energy is in potential energy and I have it sinusoidally oscillating so that my potential energy as a function of time does this. If I initially start entirely in potential energy, energy so delta equals zero, up here, my uh, initial kinetic energy is at a minimum, let me do pink, and it is also oscillating. So the energy is a function of time. The total energy is a constant, but the energy oscillates sinusoidally back and forth between potential and kinetic energy. So then we can look and try to expand what we've done to two dimensions. And this is really cool because it actually turns out that the equations can be decoupled. So let us have a force which is proportional to some constant times the vector displacement. And um, we're going to assume it's the same constant everywhere. So this is equal to m r double dot. And then, now note that, strictly speaking, we could consider that there might be different um, constants in every direction, but for now, we'll just keep the same constant. And we have, we can write r double dot equals negative k over m r, which we separate into two or even three equations. Which all have solutions of the same form. Now, in principle, there can be uh, different constants. Um, so all we get that um, x of t equals x max cosine omega t minus delta x and something similar for y I'm slipping z in even though the book didn't actually cover it because it's just so easy. It's obvious that this, um, that this it can be expanded. And even you could have different constants and all that would change is that you would have different omegas for each of these. As, so if you did that, you would have... Um, you couldn't write it this simply because you would have to have different equations for each variable. And then what you can see is that in general, you can have the x and the y um, positions decoupled. So you could have something where, depending on how you start it, you only have, let me actually go ahead and draw an x and a y coordinate an xy plane. I'm only going to consider x and y now because I can't really show you three dimensions super well. So x, y, and then 
I could have motion where I initially started in the x direction. And then what you can even see from these equations, if I start with an initial displacement in the x direction and there's no external forces, it's just going to keep oscillating back and forth in the x direction. If I start it with an initial, um, with an initial uh, oscillation in, say, along a diagonal, it's just going to keep um, in the same direction. And then I could have something where I start, they're actually slightly out of phase, so I might pull it over here, but then it gets some initial velocity in that direction, and then I can, I can have it sweep out a circle. It actually, well, it could sweep out a circle, or it could sweep out an ellipse, and then if you start talking about allowing the omegas to be different in each different direction, then you can get different funky shapes, which I'm not going to repeat and draw on the board, but they have, um, but your book has it. You basically aren't stuck with a circle or an ellipse. Um, you can move in multiple different directions. Um, and I, I would leave it as an exercise for the student to show that if you generally, so you can take an ellipse has the form x squared over x max squared plus y squared over y max squared equals some constant. And then you can see here where if x and max and y max are the same, this is the equation for a circle. If they are not the same, this sweeps out an ellipse. Well, x squared over x max is cosine squared y squared over y max is sine squared, and then, um, or sorry, is cosine squared as well, um, but you can have these phases, and that describes the equation for an ellipse. So now we're going to expand our discussion of a mass on a spring to consider more than just the spring force. We're going to consider a resistive force like the ones that we considered in chapter two. So we have mx double dot equals negative bx dot minus kx, where here we have chosen the um, linear form of resistance uh, the, with respect to velocity, not because that's necessarily the best case, because what we saw was that um, in many cases, the velocity actually depends on, the resistance, air resistance depends on the velocity squared to a much better approximation unless you're dealing with very slow objects. Now, maybe it is reasonable to talk about this as a slow object because what we're going to have is oscillatory motion, and that means that the object does get down to a velocity of zero. Um, so if you had something that were oscillating about zero, you could perhaps consider this form. But those are very small objects and very slow objects. Nevertheless, what we're going to keep in mind here is potentially the case of, say, an air cart on a spring traveling back and forth. That still would probably not be quite good enough for a linear air resistance, but it's better than not considering air resistance at all. We're going to rearrange this equation to put everything on one side so that it follows our um, typical form. And I just want to draw an analogy um, that is, so when we consider LRC circuits, we, which this is a classical mechanics class, so we're not considering LRC circuits directly, but you can write the differential equation for the charge um, on a given, across a given element as the inductance times the second derivative of the charge plus the resistance times the first derivative of the charge plus one over the capacitance times the charge, and that all equals zero. Um, so this has the, ah, I forgot to write my little zero up here. Um, so this has the same form. Once we know how to address this form, we can, we can solve problems of an LRC circuit as well. So um, we are going to rewrite this 
in the form chosen because, so we're going to divide through by m and rewrite this as x double dot plus 2 beta x dot plus omega naught squared x equals 0, where b over m equals 2 beta, and omega naught squared equals k over m. So omega naught is just the uh, angular frequency in the case that you have no damping. And then this is our damping constant. So we are going to try a trial solution of the form x of t equals a b to the r t. And what we're going to see is that this works as long as we allow r to be complex. All right, so x dot of t equals a r e to the r t x double dot of t equals a r squared e to the r t and then here um, I'm gonna write this as r x and this is r squared x so when we plug this in we get r squared x plus 2 beta r x plus omega squared x, uh, omega naught squared x equals 0, which gives us the equation r squared plus 2 beta r plus omega naught squared equals 0. So r equals negative 2 beta plus or minus 2 beta squared minus 4 times 1 times omega naught squared square root over 2 times 1. And here you can see why we called the the um, why we called it this 2 beta instead of just beta. All right. And then we can factor out the 2 and we get negative beta plus or minus the square root of beta squared minus omega squared. So this solution indeed works. Now you can have, if beta squared is less than omega squared, then this has an imaginary component, and we're going to talk about what that, what that means. So, first of all, um, we can have undamped oscillation. And when we do that, um, then we get, that is for the case, there's no damping, beta equals zero, so r equals plus or minus i omega naught squared, and our solutions have the form x of t equals some constant e to the i omega naught t plus some other constant e to the negative i omega naught t. Okay, that one is basically the special case of the case we did already. So we considered what happened if beta equals zero. It's good. We take our solution for when we allowed beta to be non-zero, and we get back to the solution that we had in the first place. We can also have weak damping. So in the case of weak damping, then beta is much less than, um, beta is much less than, 
or is less than omega naught. So we can um, write this as omega 1 squared equals omega naught squared minus beta squared. And then r equals negative beta plus or minus i omega 1. Um, so here, the reason why it's omega 1 and not um, omega naught, it's there, the damping does act, actually slightly shift the oscillation frequency. And then our solutions look like x of t is e to the negative beta t, c1 e to the i omega 1 t plus c2 e to the negative i omega 1. Oh, you can't see that up there. Let me write that on a different line. So it has the same form as this answer up here, but there's a slight shift in the actual value. So x of the angular frequency, x of t is e to the beta t, c1 e to the i omega 1 t plus c2 e to the negative i omega 1 t. So you have the same solution in here, or the same form in here, you, and then you have this envelope. So this has, we could also use our cosine form for this one, and then there would just be some different constant out in front, cosine omega 1 t minus delta. So what you see is If your oscillations without damping do this, and e to the negative beta t does this, my drawing is, leaves some to be desired your oscillations will I actually have to draw it on both sides. You get so used to drawing by computer that I'm not used to, you know, I miss being able on this white on this board being able to just hit undo. Okay, so then ah, I'm having trouble drawing this well. Let me start this over again. But you have this envelope of the exponential decay and the amplitude of the oscillations is bounded by that envelope. So, whoop, whoop. And then we have, without Damping, let me actually draw more oscillations in some way that's actually easier to draw. Um, and then here, and I'm going to try to draw it symmetrically, but remember I am a physicist and not an artist. So then my damped oscillations have the same form. There's a very slight shift in that omega naught, but it's hard to draw, it's hard to really see. So I have the same form, but bounded by this envelope from e to the negative beta t. I can then consider strong damping. So strong damping is where beta is greater than omega naught. And in this case, um, I have only an exponential. So here, if I have, if this number is greater than that number, I just have, so here I have to put a plus or a minus, I dropped the 
plus when I moved it over. Um, no matter what, this if beta is greater than omega naught, this is always a negative number, and my x of t is some constant e to the negative r1t plus some other constant e to the negative r2t. Either way, it's some form of exponential decay. And finally, if I have critical damping, that's the case where beta is equal to omega naught. In that case, my r is only, so beta equals omega naught. Then here, this term is zero, and I only have one solution, r equals negative beta. Now, that gives me part of my solution, but it's not a complete solution. To have a complete set of solutions, I need to have, um, I need to have two different solutions um, because it's a second order differential equation. Now, if I had a first order differential equation, meaning that I only had a first derivative, I can get one solution. We saw one solution worked when we had uh, projectile motion. That was a first order differential equation. There's only one solution. This is a second order differential equation. There's two solutions. So I am going to add, um, I'm going to tweak my trial solution here. Um, this is something that you would learn in a differential equations class. <clears throat> but uh, you do the same approach. You use it as a trial and you see how it works. All right, so then here, your first derivative, you're going to add a t there instead of just the, um, instead of just a e to the r t. And then when you take this derivative, you have to do the chain rule. So here you have a t r e to the r t plus a e to the r t. And here, now this thing gets uglier. Now, when I take, I take the derivative of this term, and then I get an a r e to the r t um, when I take the derivative here. So I get, I take the derivative of the e to the r t, and that gives me this term. I take the derivative of t and multiply it by everything else, and that gives me this term. And then I take the derivative of this, and it gives me an a e to the r t. I have two of them, so there I have a 2. Um, and in this particular case, beta equals omega naught. I have to put in my test solution again, and I'm going to see if this works. Um, so, OK. So I should warn you, I'm also flying without a net here. I didn't work through testing out the trial solutions. Um, we're going to plug them in here. We're going to use beta equals omega naught. Um, and I'm just going to use the omega naught. So here, I'm going to move way out here because I think I'm going to need the room. How far can I go? All right, A r squared t e to the r t plus 2 a r ah, and our r was negative beta so here i'm going to go ahead and put in a negative put in a negative beta so here I have negative a, 2 negative a beta e to the r t plus 2 beta a times t 
times negative beta. I'm keeping my finger there so that I don't forget what I'm what term I'm on. Um, e to the r t. I'm just going to leave the r's in the exponents because who cares? All right, that's this term here, and then I have plus two beta. Ah, I see a mistake here already. I should have had two beta squared. So plus two beta a e to the r t. That's just putting in r equals beta and multiplying two beta by this term. Plus, now here, I'm omega naught is just beta squared. A T E to the R T. This should all equal zero. Here, I'm going to go ahead and divide through by E to the R T because that will mean way less for me to multiply through by. I can see that this term is equal to that term and opposite in sign. So these guys cancel out. That is going to simplify things a lot. And here, Ah, yes, this has a 2 by it, so here I have to add this term too. And then, it, then these three underlined terms cancel out. Now, this is where all of my beautiful colors help out, so I'm also going to draw a squiggle line. You can see that this term, two a, negative 2a beta, cancels out that term, and I am left with 0. So, my critically damped solutions, um, then follow the form x of t, I have switched colors inadvertently, um, the form x of t equals some constant e to the negative beta t plus some other constant, e times t, e to the negative beta t. And the reason this works is basically when you just increase, you add a polynomial as a function of t uh, out in front, when you take the derivative, you still keep the same basic form. Now, if we had a third order differential equation and we needed three solutions and the roots were all equal, we would add another power of t. Um, this is something that you would learn in your differential equations class. Okay, so then I can summarize um, what we have, the type of damping, and what beta is, and what the decay parameter is in front of our solution. Oh, I see this cut off the very edge of my answer. So if we have no damping, beta is zero, and there's no decay parameter. If we have what we call under damping, so this was what we have for A, under damping is B, that um, beta is less than omega naught, then so beta is less than omega naught, and then the decay parameter is beta. Critical damping is actually, well, actually, I'm going to switch the order of these from the book, over damping is when beta is greater than omega naught, and then our decay parameter is beta minus the square root of beta squared minus omega naught squared. 
And then the last solution, critical damping, is when beta is exactly equal to omega naught, and then the damping parameter is beta. So now we've covered all sorts of different types of solutions for something oscillating as a mass on a spring. Um, and they all, um, they all are describing different types of, of scenarios. For instance, what you want for your car is you want critical damping for your shock absorbers so that you don't oscillate back and forth. Whereas uh, when you have an experiment in the lab where you're trying to measure the spring constant and we pretend that there is no damping, you're pretty close to under damping. It's important to remember all of these solutions because in the next, the next section, we're gonna expand this and talk about driving it. And each of these solutions may be, uh, are, are going to be what we call the homogeneous, uh, the solution to the homogeneous equation. All right, so now we're going to return to our original form, mx double dot plus bx dot plus kx. We had equals zero. Now we're going to consider that we are adding a driving force. So here you have some additional force. And I am, um, in principle, can be as a function of time. I'm just going to write this real quickly as uh, Newton's second law so that it's a little, ob a little more obvious what we're talking about physically. So you have some object that acts like a mass on a spring, where you're at least in the approximation of being able to treat it like a mass on a spring. There is some resistance to this. Um, so there's some restoring, or there's some, uh, some air resistance or um, other non-conservative force. And then you're driving it. So this might be um, you have, let's take the bottle that was bobbing up and down in the water. Now you're going to be pushing it. So you might be pushing it with some force that you can approximate as a force as a function of time. And so there's three different forces acting on it. One of them, you're just, we allow it to be anything of any form. And this also is analogous to our LRC circuit. Where now we have some applied electric field as well. Um, and for simplicity, we are going to put this back in the form that we had, x double dot plus 2 beta plus um, omega naught squared, at, I dropped my x dot, omega dot, omega dot naught squared x equals now lowercase f of t, where lowercase f of t is the for applied force divided by the mass. And I'm going to call this, I'm trying to get you used to thinking about things described as operators. So I'm going to call, I'm going to define this as a linear operator. Linear because we do not have, say, the velocity squared. And I will define this to find an operator d squared dx squared plus 2 beta d, or sorry, this should be a dt, 2 beta dt plus omega naught squared. And then I can rewrite this equation as my operator d acting on x equals f of t. Here I'm going to switch back to my one of my two favorite markers. I've decided yellow is just as good as green. Um, so I can have um, 
if I have, I can in general write a, uh, I can write this. This is what we call the homogeneous equation. So the solutions that we just talked about are the solutions to the homogeneous equation. So when you set this equal to zero. And then um, we, so we call these h sub x sub h. And then we're going to talk about the particular solutions. So if we have some solution where this operator acting on x has the functional form f. Um, whereas then we can write the complete solution. Any possible solution is going to be um, some, con you know, whatever our, whatever our solution for the homogeneous solution is plus the solution for the, partic the particular solution. So this is going to include all those constants before. We had two different forms that we, in each of the forms, we had two different constants to describe all possible solutions. Um, and then we're going to dive in and con consider a particular form of f of t. So we're going to stop worrying now about the homogeneous solution, and we're going to only worry about finding the particular solution dive into that and see if we can solve it in one very useful case. Um, and the reason that's a useful case we will get to, you can describe then any possible solution as any possible function f in that form. So you can describe any possible solution. So we're going to have a driving force f naught cosine omega t. And I just want to highlight here that we've used a few different omegas. Omega naught is what you have without damping. We used omega 1 when there is damping. And now we're dropping the subscripts. And this is the omega for the driving force. And then um, we are going to write this we're going to write this in two different ways we're going to assume there's two different functions x double dot plus 2 beta x dot plus omega naught squared x equals f naught cosine omega t and then the same thing with a sine omega t but I'm just going to rename the variable y instead of x. So I'm considering, and then I'm going to use this trick. I'm going to say that z equals x plus i y. And then my equation becomes z double dot plus 2 beta z dot plus omega naught squared z equals f naught e to the i omega t. So I'm using Euler's equation. And now you can see that if I take the real and imaginary parts of this equation, I get this is the real part of this equation. This is the imaginary part of this equation. I will leave that as an exercise to the student to show which means it's a bunch of boring, ugly algebra. Um, all right, then we are going to try a test solution of z of t equals c e to the i omega t. And that means that z dot equals i omega c e to the i omega t, which is equal to i omega z, z double dot, is equal to 
I squared omega squared, or negative omega squared, C e to the i omega t, which is equal to negative omega squared z. So I'm using this test solution. I'm going to see if I can find, I'm going to see if this works and if I can find a, uh, a constant c that describes it. So now my f naught, before we had constants out in front for our solutions that told us the, the relative magnitudes of the different solutions. My relative magnitude is fixed here. So then here, I am going to use this equation. I have z double dot, so negative omega squared z plus 2 beta z dot, so i omega z, and then plus omega naught squared z equals, now I'm going to write my laziness of putting the z's here is somewhat hurting me. I want to leave a z everywhere, so I can write f naught e to the i omega t equals c over f naught over c e to the i omega t, which is equal to f naught over c e to the i omega t. And so this is, or sorry, F naught over C times Z. So this is F naught over C times Z. I have a Z everywhere. And this I can, this is now a constant. So I can multiply everywhere by C and divide by this thing, which I am going to call mess, so I don't have to copy it over. And I get that C equals F naught over omega naught squared minus omega squared plus two beta I omega. And I could rearrange this, so my solution was C. Um, I could rearrange this in terms of my solution. Uh, I, can, I want to write my solution X particular in the form A cosine omega T minus delta. For the, um, for the real part of the equation, and I will leave it as an exercise to the student to show, that means it's a bunch of dumb, ugly algebra. A is this thing. So what you would do is multiply on top and bottom by the complex conjugate, so that you get um, you get this thing in the um, the denominator, and then you would take the real and the imaginary parts, and then delta is two beta omega over omega naught squared minus omega squared. So that's the particular solution and your solutions in general would have the form where you could have the particular solution plus your homogeneous solution. And then we're going to zoom in in the next section and talk about the, uh, this should be an A, there should be an A squared and a squared there.
So we're going to zoom in and talk about this behavior. All right, so here you can see that the, um, the amplitude goes up very sharply when the driving force gets really close to the, um, close to the omega naught. And specifically, um, so you're looking for where this denominator um, is at its maximum. And again, I will leave it as an exercise for the student to do this because it's a bunch of ugly, uh, of ugly algebra. This denominator is at a maximum when omega is equal to omega 2 is equal to omega naught squared minus 2 beta squared square root. So if beta is small, this is very close to the um, very close to the natural resonance without damping. If there is significant damping, this can be a significant shift. Um, and we then are left with three different omegas. We have omega naught is the square root of k over m. Omega 1 is the frequency of the, damp, the damped oscillator without driving it. Omega is the driving frequency. Let me call it the driving, let me write out frequency. Spec specifically, it's the driving angular frequency. Um, and omega 2 is omega naught squared minus 2 beta squared square root. We call this the resonance frequency. Um, so then uh, this is where the, the amplitude of the oscillations is at a maximum. If you drive a system just right, it tends to, it is at its maximum amplitude. Um, and this A max is approximately equal to your driving frequency divided by twice beta omega naught. Um, now we've talked about this for a one-dimensional uh, resonance, but of course you can have similar, uh, similar behavior when you have three-dimensional objects, when you have um, oscillations in multiple different dimensions. And we can then look at the width of this amplitude if you sketch it for typical values. You will see, all right, we're going to plot amplitude squared. It looks something like this, where Here, this is your resonance, omega. Um, and we quantify the width of this peak. Um, we talk, so the, the full width at half maximum is two beta. Um, the half width at half, half maximum is beta. And we talk about the quality of the resonance as the position divided by the width which is roughly omega naught over to beta. Um, and you can talk about, you can quantify this with the decay time for the oscillation, how rapidly the oscillation goes away, which is one over beta. Um, and the period, two pi over omega. In general, Q can also be described as the um, number of periods in, uh, in the decay time. You will run across Q or the quality factor in a bunch of other different contexts. Anytime you're talking about resonance, resonance we quantify the Q factor and the higher the Q, the sharper the resonance and the, sh the longer the decay time, the longer the resonance lasts. Um, and there is actually a phase at resonance. So at the phase at resonance, the tangent of the phase at resonance is 2 beta omega over 
omega naught squared minus omega squared, which means that there is actually a slight phase shift. The, um, the oscillation is lagging ever so slightly, the, or possibly more, um, the driving force. Um, and when the driving force is much, uh, the driving frequency is much greater than the, um, the natural frequency, then this uh, tangent of, well, then theta goes to pi. So it's exactly out of phase with the driving force. So why did we specifically look at a functional form of sines and cosines? Well, because it turns out that we can actually describe any periodic, func any periodic function as a sum of sines and cosines. So if I have a periodic function f of t plus, so if I have a periodic function with a period t for so for that period, f of t plus tau is equal to f of t. That's what it means for a function to be periodic. And in, if I have a function like that, I can always describe that function as this, the sum of sines and cosines an is some constant. So an cosine n omega t plus bn sine n omega t. Um, and omega is 2 pi times the frequency, which is 2 pi over the period. And my an are given by 2 over the period times negative, the an for n greater than 1 is 2 over the period times the integral from over one period. Now, you're, it really doesn't matter if it, which period it is, your book defines it from negative t over 2 to positive t over 2, it just has to be the integral over a period. There are many times when it is easier to set it up in a different way. Remember that a good physicist is a lazy physicist, so do it whatever makes the math easiest. B, N, and then here we don't have to worry about, ah, we actually do want to set B, N equals zero. Um, I can do this slightly differently. Start at 1 and say a 0 plus. Otherwise, I have to worry about b0. 2 over tau. This has the same form. All that matters is that you integrate over one period. Sine n omega t dt. And... A0 equals 1 over the period times the integral over 1 period. F of t dt. That's sort of the same thing. This really is the case of, Z, of, of n equals 0 for that particular equation. So um, you, can, uh, you can describe any function is these sine, sums of sines and cosines. Right now, I'm, I'm not going to give you a proof, so you should, unfortunately, just take it on faith. I'm telling you this is true. Um, and actually, we're talking about this for sines and cosines, but you can describe any function as the sum of any nice, neat, well-behaved, my mathematicians are going to squirm when I say any function. There are some limits. It has to be differentiable, smooth, on and on and on. Um, you can describe any function as the sum of a bunch of different functions, as long as the set of functions is what we call a complete set. So if you have watched my little refresher on linear algebra, uh, or, in, or 
linear algebra, a quick summer crash course in linear algebra, you, this will be a little bit familiar, you know, the same way that we talk about being able to describe vectors as any sum of basis vectors, you can describe a function as any sum of any complete set of functions. So here we have sines and cosines. There are other sets of functions that are complete. So when we talk about a Taylor series, a Taylor series is just a special case because the set of all polynomials is a complete set. So you can describe any function as a sum of polynomials. Sometimes you also have to allow the, the negative powers as well. Um, and later when you get to quantum mechanics, you're going to see uh, special functions such as the Hermite polynomials that are also a complete set. Um, so then we can do a special case. Uh, this is example 5.4 and this is uh, the Fourier series for a square wave. What we mean by that which I didn't think was super well defined in the book. Um, here we have a height of one. It repeats itself with a period of one. So period is one. We have uh, um, the width is one quarter. And then we can do each of these. So here we're going to do, so one over the period is one over one. And then here, this is the integral from negative one eighth to positive one eighth dt, which is just equal to one quarter. Um, uh, and here I've got the width of the pulse is 0.25 and f max is 1. I could write this in general as f max times the width divided by the period. For my a n, here I have 2 over f max over tau. And then the integral from negative, here I'm doing this more general, ne generally negative tau over 2, negative delta tau over 2 to positive delta tau over 2, cosine n pi, so, sorry, 2 pi n. get the, no, I have n and then my omega, yeah, 2 pi over tau. So in this case, my omega is 2 pi. So this is 2 pi n over tau t dt. This is 2 I, or sorry, 2 over tau f max. That's just my constants out in front. And then I get something of the form sine n pi delta t, or sorry, delta tau over tau. And I have to divide to get my constants right. I divide by n pi over tau. And that there's not much simplification that I can do there. And then for my bn, here you can use symmetry and go, well, this looks more like cosine because it is an odd function. An odd function means that f of negative x equals f of x. f of 
for an even function, f of negative x equal, or sorry, sorry, this is an even function. Da, 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 da. Oop. This is an even function, which means that f of x, f of negative x is equal to f of x. An odd function means that f of negative x is equal to negative f of x. Cosines are an even function. Cosine of negative x is equal to cosine of x. Sines are an odd function. Sine of negative x equals negative sine of x. So um, when I'm doing my uh, Fourier series, which is what this is called, then I, if I have an even function, I'm only going to get cosine terms because, I have an, because cosines are even. If I have an odd function, I'm only going to get sine terms because sines are odd. So using that, I know I'm going to get zero, but I am still going to show you that I get zero because the whole point of me being here is to teach. All right, so now I have something very similar. Except this is the integral of sine 2 pi n t over tau and dt. And when I do this, I get... 2f max tau over tau n pi, and now I get, uh, this should be a, I messed up here. Let's see, co yeah, wait, these should be cosines, this should be sine, and this, yeah, this gives me cosine of something minus cosine of the same, cosine of minus the same thing. Ah, you cannot see that. Cosine of a max minus cosine of minus the, the same mess. So we had a term like that up here, but sine of, sine is odd, so I had this turned into sine of a mess plus sine of a mess. Here, cosine is even, so this is cosine of the mess minus cosine of the mess, which is equal to zero. All right, so then we get to the point of doing all of this, which is that if we have an arbitrary function, which we are driving our damped harmonic oscillator with, we can describe that arbitrary function as the sum. Well, we can describe it as F0. Well, we'll consider only the cosine terms. So yeah, we can, well, so we can describe this as the sum from n equals zero. So this would be, um, this would be an even driving function. And you can, I will leave it as an exercise for the student to show what you get for a general function. Just a sum, you can describe your driving function as a sum of cosines if it is an even function. And then the x sub n have for the, or sorry, the x, yeah, the x sub n have, which are the solutions to this, have the form a sub n cosine omega t. And the a sub n have the form f sub n over omega naught squared minus n squared omega squared quantity squared plus 4 beta n squared omega squared. There are phase shifts. Let me write them tan of delta 
2, beta, n, omega. This is all the same thing, except that I am just putting in my different form for omega. It's now n times omega instead of omega. And my particular solution is then n equals 0, um, a sub n, cosine to n equals 0 to infinity, a sub n cosine, n omega t minus delta n. Voila. So I can take any driving function and I can describe what the simple harmonic oscillator does for that driving function.